Hello, everybody. Happy weekend. Welcome to Digital Charcuterie. My name is Andrew Fantasia, and I realized something. I did uh, a few days ago after the... a few days ago, a couple days ago, after the DC Superheroes United campaign came to an end, we did a live stream together with myself, the Meeple Monkey, and with Dave, the Diversion Architect, and the three of us just gushed and just had a lot of fun talking about how much fun we had throughout this campaign. And you can see that right here on the channel. Um, you can check it out. The, the thumbnail has a picture of Condiment King on it because it's Condiment King. Uh, but I realized after I made that live stream that there were still a lot of stretch goal updates that I never got around to sort of reacting to and sharing my thoughts about with all of you. So that's what this video is. This is the wrap up of the campaign part two, just me, uh, and we will be looking over the updates that I missed talking about and just gushing about them because they are pretty beautiful too. Before we get started, all the regular YouTube stuff, please like and bell and subscribe. And please also check out my books, We Were Wizards, on Amazon right now all over the world. If you like old school fun fantasy adventure, if you like things like Lord of the Rings, like The Lies of Locke Lamora, like uh, the Fafford and the Grey Mouser, all that stuff, then check out We Were Wizards. I wrote these myself. They are my pride and joy. The purple one is the first one, and then this is the next one to read. And you can get them in hardcover, paperback, or even ebook. Um, and I just, I had so much fun writing these, and there's plenty more in the series to come. So if you know somebody who's a wizard fan, and I'm not talking about the basketball team, boom. So let's jump down into the Game Found page and take a look at all the goodies that I missed out on talking about. So as we pop into the updates here, here is Zod. Uh, we are we definitely who we unlock Zod. We knelt before him, and the next thing that they came out with was this right here: Task Force X. Now I didn't know that Task Force X and Suicide Squad are two different things. I thought it was just you know two different names for one similar thing. But apparently, no, there's this whole other team that also involves Black Manta and Reverse Flash, and hey, I am okay with this. So we get Task Force X as a villain mode with an oversized dashboard, and uh, it says here, we have already seen Amanda Waller assemble one team of villains to do her dirty work with the Suicide Squad, but with so many bad guys being added to this campaign, why not have Task Force X assemble a different strike team? The Task Force X mode offers players a unique battle against four united villains, Deadshot, Captain Boomerang, Black Manta, and Reverse Flash. Each of the villains starts in a different location adjacent to their side of the villain dashboard. Ah, okay. So, yeah, next to their side of it. That's cool. Each of those locations is one of the villains' safe zone, where they're safe from damage. Neat. These villains are no fools and will often run for cover in their safe zones. The master plan cards each activates a different pair of villains, moving them, triggering their BAM and adding thugs to their locations, while the other two villains add civilians to their locations. Overflows help the villains interfere with the hero's progress, removing a token from an incomplete mission, while KOing heroes accelerates the Task Force X master plan playing a card face down. Deadshot uses his uncanny marksmanship to snipe heroes across the play area. Captain Boomerang uses his signature weapon to hit strike a hero in an adjacent location. And then a hero in his own location. Black Manta is going to disable hero's equipment or one of their cards with special effects in the storyline. And Reverse Flash runs counterclockwise, hitting heroes in each location he enters. While the threats keep heroes from using location effects, once they are cleared, they actually help the heroes out. Tactical Advantage gives the hero an action token of their choice, while Tactical Positioning allows the hero to use move tokens to dislocate villains, ideally out of their safe zone. A very different type of multi-villain battle but a very welcome one i love the idea of adding this you know of adding task force x to the list of villain options when i throw it all into my random number generator right this is just another number to add to the list of villains i love it and it's separate from suicide squad too very very cool and after task force x we got this fella right here the hero dead man who is a character I did not expect to see in season one either. He's he's kind of left of center. He is very popular, but he's pretty left of center. So I didn't think we would see him this early in DC Superheroes United uh, in, in its existence, essentially. But here he is, Boston Brand, the dead man. Very few people can see or hear him. He's a ghost. He just goes around 
possessing other folks and that's exactly how he's going to be played look he has his own card with rules of how to be a ghost so dead man is an extremely unique hero after all he's essentially a ghost yeah the good part of being dead is that he can never take any damage or be forced to discard cards from his hand the bad part of being dead is that he can only act by possessing others this means he can only perform attacks or heroic actions in locations with any civilians or thugs and if he ends his turn in an empty location he is immediately KO'd. Ugh. Dead Man is always watching and learning from the living, gaining action tokens whenever other heroes perform a couple actions in his vicinity. He can also be summoned to any location where a hero is KO'd or an overflow happens, so he may deal with the situation. So just once again, another really unique hero who just plays different. It doesn't just feel like a palette swap of someone else. He's his own thing. He's got this terrifying base full of skulls and smoke and stuff. What a great way to utilize Dead Man. And he was a tricky hero, I'm sure, for them to design because of how different he is, but I think they nailed it. They didn't make him OP, but they didn't make him samey for everybody else. Then we got this here, support forces, uh, supporting forces rather. So when you're playing DC Superheroes United in commander solo mode, you normally would need to pick 12 cards from four other heroes, but the supporting forces deck means you don't have to mess with other heroes decks and instead you just get a more kind of generic support. So you're, you're making the 12 card deck randomly by choosing the cards you want to use. Uh, so there, you're getting 20 of these, but you're just taking 12. So it's a little bit different every time you use it. So you have constant effects like vehicle commandeering that allows you to use any action token to move, or false targets where you can discard action tokens to avoid damage. Uh, so it's just a bunch of little options for your hero. If you don't feel like messing around with other decks, it just makes it that much easier to do Commander Solo if that's how you fly. So that's nice. That's, that's really helpful. That's just throwing the players a bone and letting them kind of make the solo mode a little bit easier to manage. I play solo almost all the time, but I'm still definitely uh, a three-handed solo guy. I love just playing three heroes just as a solo player. Uh, that's how I roll. But I'm sure this deck will come in handy for many people. And after that, look at this big hunk of, hunk of burning love. It is Clayface, and he's dripping with malice according to the update this batman villain was i wouldn't say sorely missing because i don't think i don't know i could be wrong i don't think clayface is anybody's favorite batman villain i i don't want to sound mean I'm, I'm just saying that i don't think he's anybody's favorite though to be fair i have i literally just uh watched the first few episodes of the new batman cape crusader cartoon and that cartoon did clayface better than i've ever seen anybody else do Clayface. So there's that. But I mean, he's a classic Batman villain still. He's part of the, the stable of rogues that, that Batman is famous for fighting. Uh, so it's it makes sense to put him in here. And I love that he's in here because it would feel incomplete otherwise. And they nailed his look with that big gaping maw of his. And man, his miniature looks gross. It's just dripping with clay. I guess one of the best things about this is now we have Ron Perlman playable in United. So there's that. There's his dashboard with all of his goodies. So in spite of his monstrous appearance, Clayface remains obstinate in reclaiming the fame he once had. His fame track increases every time he KOs a hero. So he's got a fame track hiding under there that we can't see. That's ideal, right? Because he's he's a, a movie star. He's trying to get famous. Uh, when that increases, uh, increases every time he kills a hero, causes an overflow, or springs a hidden trap that a hero can't deal with. The heroes lose if they can't defeat him before he reaches full infamy. This will be quite a challenge as Clayface keeps the double wild card from each hero for himself. Let me repeat that. That's a big deal. He keeps the double wild card from each hero for himself, using them to shape shift into them. Any hero, except for the one Clayface is currently imitating, must spend a heroic action before they are even able to attack him. Meanwhile, Clayface's own attacks can be quite devastating. So he's going to be setting threats and traps. Heroes have to reveal specific things on the cards in their hand or sacrifice specific cards in order to clear those traps. Otherwise, the fame track advances. Wow, yeah, see, these they don't even have the, the symbols for heroic things. So one or more heroes are in this location, flip this threat, and apply its effect. Oh, okay, so there's... His traps are really complicated, and what a great way to utilize the fact that he morphs into different people. Because that's a superpower that I think gets used a little too much. Like, Mystique does it. Chameleon does it. The Skrulls do it. That's one of the reasons why I'm not a big Skrull guy. Because it's like, oh wow, okay, you can shapeshift. Yay. Alright, so can 40 other characters, right? Uh, and Clayface can do the same thing. The fact that they really went different with him than anything we saw Mystique do and anything we saw Chameleon do, like, that's admirable. 
that they, they managed to do that. They managed to make Clayface feel different and he's going to be imitating you specifically, the heroes, by taking your cards. So yeah, that's a great way to use him. And once we were done with that, we got this very exciting update. Being that our friends Captain Cold and Bizarro are no longer red villain pieces, they are purple dual mode characters. And when I did my hypothetical DC United, I put both of these guys as purple anti-heroes, so this update really made me happy. So you've asked for it and the powers that be conceded to it. This was no simple task, so don't expect more of it. I understand. Thank you, Simon. But when the next stretch goal is unlocked, we will add to every pledge the crowdfunding exclusive components to turn the previously unlocked Captain Cold and Bizarro into dual mode characters by giving each of them 12 hero cards and turning their figures purple. Captain Cold will also get one equipment card, and there it is right there, his cold gun. Very famous piece of DC equipment. Also, I love that his hero symbol on his card is just his glasses. That's really funny. Uh, and they have said that the artwork is coming right now. This is just placeholder artwork because they didn't have special hero artwork ready to go because they weren't planning on him being a hero. I love this. I love having, you know, the more purple characters the merrier and both of these, particularly Bizarro, because there is a version of Bizarro who wears a purple costume. Both of these are characters that I envisioned being purple going into this, so I'm very happy. So as a hero, Captain Cold uses his cold and calculating mind to analyze the enemy's tactics, revealing the next master playing card and gaining different action tokens, depending on whether it will add more thugs or civilians. He's also an excellent marksman, striking a target anywhere. But it's his cold abilities that are the real showstoppers, creating a cryogen wall that can stop the villain in its tracks, or brewing up a snowstorm that keeps thug and civilian tokens from being added anywhere in his vicinity. Though, other heroes will have some difficulty trudging out of the deep snow. All right? He's not going to make it easy for his teammates. He's still kind of a jerk. Captain Cold, I mean, look at that grin. Look at that grin. That's not the grin of a nice guy. He's got his own MO, right? He, he's not playing nice. Uh, and then uh, Bizarro, it, his villain mode above and beyond already. But now, add to that, he has hero cards that are all upside down and backwards with arrows pointing the wrong way. And as we see here... Uh, his hero cards are all weird. The heroes can't figure out how to benefit from his actions, so they skip his cards in the storyline and use the previous one instead. And also, Bizarro skips other heroes' cards using his own previous card in the storyline for additional action symbols. Easily damaged, Bizarro always ignores one damage every hero turn and is the last to be assigned any damage, though his physiology may cause him to lose any of his action tokens. That's right, he's... <laughs> he's just hilarious. This is... what a outstanding use of this character. I think, like, design-wise, he really might just be the best in this entire campaign. The way they handled Bizarro all throughout. Ah, I love seeing that art of those two together. Beautiful. And then up here, hey, look at this. This was a character that nobody was really clamoring for, uh, based on what I saw in the fan comments. Everybody just kept continuously saying, hey, Simon, you don't need to put in Green Arrow if you don't want to. So, I thought it was kind of a strange choice that they added him anyway, but he's here now, I guess, for the two people who might end up using him. <laughs> this is Green Arrow, he's finally here, so everybody can relax, we have Green Arrow. And yes, if you have Marvel, you can team him up with Hawkeye. Now, he is simpatico in some way with Black Canary, uh, card-wise, I just can't remember how, something about her having you know, friends who are archers. That's all I remember her update saying. But as we see here, he's got six equipment cards. He's got his own trick arrows, just like Hawkeye. So his skill with the bow is unparalleled, striking true again and again, but that's not all he's good at. He's also a martial arts expert, able to evade damage and strike unexpectedly, as well as a survival expert who will stay in the fight when others would have already fallen. He always has a trick up his sleeve, or rather a trick arrow in his quiver, being able to not only easily recharge them, but even pick an extra one mid-game. That's thematic. It's like he's reaching into that quiver and finding another spare arrow that'll help him out. So he has to choose which three are best suited for the villain he's about to engage, just like Batman. He's got a bolo arrow, a boxing glove arrow, which is my favorite, a remote detonator arrow, a neutralizer arrow, and a boomerang arrow. Nice. And there's the beautiful painted emerald archer himself. Wonderful. And after that, we got this stretch goal. The Seven Soldiers of Victory, another team deck. I always welcome team decks. These are so much fun. Even though I haven't gotten to use them yet because I'm still waiting on that multiverse uh, to arrive. And nothing, no word yet from them, uh, but I'm really excited to try these out. Now, 
I'm familiar with a lot of DC, but I'm going to be honest, I have never heard of the Seven Soldiers of Victory. And I'm also a little bit confused because there's only six members of this team, right? I'm counting that correctly. They're created in World War II and reassembled recently to bring aid whenever it's needed. They are Batgirl, Dead Man, Green Arrow, Stargirl, Stripe, and Zatanna. That's six people. I don't know who the Seventh Soldier of Victory is. I Maybe that's like a, a joke, a, a running joke throughout the team. I don't know. And as they introduced that team, they also decided to add Stripe as a sidekick in the sidekick box. That box is getting more and more interesting every time I think about it. At first, I was just like, ah, it's, you know, it, it, it's pets with some more stuff. The more I look at it, the more I'm like, this could really become an interesting thing in the future. The more sidekicks we add, the more fun I think we can have to this. Not just like adding new characters who are sidekicks like Aqualadden, Kid Flash, whatever. Like they're coming, you know, seasons down the road. But also retroactively making people sidekicks. Like go back to Marvel and maybe do the same thing there, right? I can't think offhand, like Marvel's not as sidekick heavy as DC. I can't think offhand of uh, too many Marvel sidekicks, but if we have a few there, and I'm sure we do, maybe, you know, this could become a really, really big new feature that a lot of people start using. So that's exciting. But yeah, I still don't know who that seventh soldier of victory is. If anybody wants to help me out with that, please chime in in the comments. And then up here, we got another little retroactively added thing, which I'm sure made plenty of people very happy. Simple as a pimple, Clayface and Bane were not part of the Arkham box, but they are some pretty big name Batman villains. So naturally, they can now be played as fugitives in Arkham Asylum Breakout. Beautiful. Obviously, you need that box, but if you're the type of person who got really excited by this update, you probably already got the box. So no problems there. So anybody who's ever wanted to live out their dream of playing as Bane or Clayface, here you go. You're welcome. So as a fugitive, Clayface is able to change his shape to blend among the Arkham Asylum personnel, avoiding the antagonist's attacks if there are civilians in his location. Yeah, because he's going to morph into them. His corrosive touch could be very nasty, discarding a couple of civilians and damaging the antagonist if they end their movement in his location. Ooh. He can even replicate another fugitive's ability, copying the special effect of their card in the storyline and turning it face down. Ooh, that's mean. That's going to be interesting because it feels like their cards are going to be very... Uh, they're, they're not going to be as teamwork oriented, right? They're, they're a bit more catty. They're, they don't want to help each other out as much as they want to step on each other to get out. So he's turning other fugitives' cards face down. That is just another nice little touch that makes this feel different from actually playing as a hero. And what's Bane going to do? As a fugitive, he's quite the powerhouse with plenty of actions on his cards, especially attacks, constantly pumping himself up with his Venom super steroids. He accumulates crisis tokens and deals out an attack for each token he has accumulated. However, if he pushes his body too far, He'll discard all Crisis Tokens and play his next card randomly. Otherwise, Bane may also choose to discard the tokens voluntarily, healing himself for each token discarded. Ooh, so it's a little bit of push your luck. Kind of almost like Strong Guy, like what they did with him. Fantastic. Colors on his cards are great too. And staying in the Batman world, next up we got this new villain to add to the box. I'm ha <laughs> It's the Batman who laughs. Now... I learned about this character not too long ago. He's fairly newish to the comics. Probably 10 years old already, I don't know. But but still, to me, that's new because I don't really read them anymore. He's a multiversal villain. I really did not expect to see him in a season one. My hypothetical DC was um, season three was the big multiverse one, just like with Marvel because I, was <laughs> I wasn't thinking super creatively, right? I just kind of did it as a one-to-one -one thing. So I had him pegged for there, but the fact that he is here is really interesting. I wonder if he was kind of a last minute addition. I know he's very popular. That new story, The Dark Knight's Metal, became a really popular thing, and he's supposed to be pretty powerful. He reminds me, you know, he reminds me of, he, reminds, he basically feels like the DC equivalent of Null, the symbiote king, right? He's a fairly newish villain who is like, mega mega powerful the story he was introduced in is like hardcore and dark and gritty and uh, and a lot of people seem to really like him like he has joined the pantheon of villains of his respective superhero and his miniature even looks kind of like nulls with the big sweeping robe and all that 
So the Batman who laughs uh, has gathered Dark Knights from all corners of the Dark Multiverse, leading them in his invasion. Acting as a mastermind, he hides behind the other versions of Batman, so he may only be damaged if there are no henchmen left in play. In fact, his BAM initially does nothing. It's only once he's under pressure that he starts pushing the heroes around and damaging them. His focus is on getting to the end of his master plan by removing cards from his deck. And then here it shows the Dark Knights who are all his henchmen. Now, I didn't read this comic, so I didn't know this. I assumed that he was just a Batman uh, from another multiverse. I didn't know they had other Batman. And to top it all off, this is very strange. Like, in this universe, Batman became Ares... In this universe, he became Doomsday? I mean, it seems like it breaks the multiverse, or at least the rules of multiverse that we know, just based off what little we've seen in comics and stuff. Uh, and this one, he's Aquaman and also a woman. Yeah, I, I'm curious now to read this story, because I, I really don't understand. Like, what? In this multiverse, Bruce Wayne became the God of War. Uh, like, he, he, he was the ancient Greek God of War. Like, I'm really flummoxed by how this works but it's really cool to see these artwork uh artworks of all these characters and then they all do different things to the heroes so you're gonna have to take out all of those six henchmen who seem like they're all pretty powerful if you want to touch the batman who laughs so awesome i know this character's got a lot of fans i'm really happy that those fans are happy now uh and we again we stay in the batman world because we have some more retroactive goodness to add to the game because now Wonder Woman can be an antagonist hunting you down in the asylum which is great she felt like she was missing from that box uh, even though that box is jam-packed Wonder Woman should have been in there so I'm really glad they put her in here and for those who wanted Poison Ivy as a hero you got your wish Please note this is an exclusive hero deck being added to every backer's pledge and Poison Ivy must remain strictly a villain in the Arkham Asylum breakout box. This means her figure will remain red, even though with this deck, you'll be able to play her as a hero. That's interesting. They've never really done that before, like outside of a, a promo hero deck like Juggernaut, right? So I'm, I'm really curious. This must have been a rights thing. This must have just been something with the licensor where they didn't want her to be referred to as an anti-hero or dual mode or whatever. So to kind of meet them halfway simon is like okay she will stay a villain she's part of the villain box we're not going to call her anything other than a villain we'll keep her red but there's a, a deck of cards so you can play with her if you want to play with her as a hero so i guess it's kind of like you get to have your cake and eat it too it's kind of like dc doesn't want to call her a hero so they're like okay dc's not going to call her a hero but we'll put this deck of cards in here so if the player wants to call her a hero the player can do that at her or his discretion I think that's okay, right? I, I can get behind that, if that's the reasoning behind why she's got to stay red. So as a hero, Poison Ivy uses the constant effect of her pheromone control starting card to lure thugs to her location so she can take them out. Evergreen, Ivy can fully heal herself if things get tough. Living up to her moniker, Poison Ivy's deadly touch places wild tokens on villains or henchmen in her location, possibly accumulating several of those and dealing damage equal to their number. Wow, that sounds powerful. And then Wonder Woman is going to be hunting you down, and I love what it says about her here. She'll be rescuing civilians and, you know, beating up thugs and stuff. But, again, just how thematic and on point it is with, with what Wonder Woman is like. Uh, where is it? Her cards allow her to use her equipment to stop the breakout, so her bracelets are going to block our attacks. And the Lasso of Truth is going to prevent us from fulfilling our carefully laid out breakout plans. That's outstanding. And that's Wonder Woman, right? That's how she rolls. So after that, we scroll up here and get to another character that I'm pretty sure going through the chat absolutely nobody was interested in seeing. So Simon must have just kind of had him in their back pocket and thought, well, we might as well throw him out there anyway until we get to someone else who's more in demand, like Arm Fall Off Boy. Uh, it's Lobo, the biggest bastiche in the galaxy, who's here to collect his bounty. And of course he's purple. I don't think anybody expected anything other than purple for Lobo's mini. He's the bounty hunter, not with the heart of gold, because he's a real big jerk. I just realized his jacket says, Bite Me Fanboy. <laughs> That's, that is great. Uh, so Lobo is such a psychopath that even calling him an anti-hero is a bit of a stretch. But this intergalactic bounty hunter sets his sights on a villain, then he's played as a hero. At the start of the game, he may assign bounty tokens to up to two villains or henchmen, gaining a wild token if he manages to defeat them. He'll do the, whatever it takes to take them out, even discarding one of his cards to deal a gruesome blow against an enemy with a bounty. He's got a regenerative healing factor to keep him healthy, and he's also got a space hog, as we see down here, 
his equipment, his space hog to move around quickly, and his garret, which he swings to take out thugs or hook villains and pull them to him. So if he attaches one of these to a villain and gets a wild token every time he defeats said villain or henchman, characters with lots of henchmen like Batman who laughs, this would be really ideal. But game modes where there are plenty of villains like Task Force X, like Sinister Six, Lobo goes after them, he throws a bounty token on a couple of them, and suddenly he's raking in the wild tokens. So real powerful. Lobo's a powerhouse. He went toe-to-toe with Superman and he did okay for himself. So it's only fair that they make him pretty powerful. But as a villain, he's out to collect bounties posted on heroes. So two heroes are given bounty tokens and Lobo will pursue and attack them mercilessly and anybody else who gets in his way. What I think is really interesting is this is the first time we've seen this as a villain the character is also going to use his equipment cards. So see here, he's got the Garrett equipment card as a villain to increase his attack damage. He recharges it every time he bams, and his Space Hog equipment card can run over his prey unless the heroes disable it. So the heroes got to run around and disable his motorcycle. That's so cool. Of course, taking out the last Zarnian will be no easy feat. Not only does his physiology make him immune to token effects and allows him to heal every villain turn, but even if the heroes do manage to blow him to Kingdom Come, he might very well be banished from heaven, or more likely hell, and come back good as new to continue his maniacal hunt. So I think that means if you beat him, he comes back with more health like Hobgoblin did. So very nice to see Lobo here. And then up here we got just this quick stretch goal regarding the box for all these stretch goals. I don't think I've ever seen a case where this was not unlocked. And of course we can't see the artwork yet because it might have contained spoilers or they might not have known who was going to go on it. I went on record a few times and guessed that I thought Supergirl would be the front and center hero on this box, but of course I have been proven wrong. And I was asked by one of the fans in uh, one of the other videos who I think will be on it now, uh, now that I know it's not Supergirl. Usually they try to cram as many of the characters on it as possible, and I think this is going to be a big box. I think it's going to be the size of the X-Men stretch goal box just considering how many miniatures we have you know slated to be in it uh so it's going to be full of characters on the artwork but i think if i had to guess i would say that the two most prominent heroes will be green arrow and black canary i think they're going to do that they're going to go with a power couple because they did that in season one they kind of put wanda and vision front and center and in season two they kind of put Nightcrawler front and center. And I mean, Green Arrow was pretty much the Nightcrawler of this campaign. And he and Black Canary are pretty much the power couple of the stretch box. So that just feels right. It feels like it adds up. I'm going to guess it right now. Let's lock it in. There it is, Vegas. Lock in my bet. Green Arrow and Black Canary will be the front and center heroes on this box. I can't wait to see that artwork because it's always beautiful. But speaking of beautiful, I never thought we would see this day. We got Parallax as a stretch goal villain. He is oversized, because of course he is, but not only that, he is 100% translucent yellow plastic on this giant red wasp nest looking base. I adore this. I never thought we would get this. I don't even know if I put Parallax in my own hypothetical DC United. I really don't think I did. I think I may have put Hal Jordan Parallax as a villain. Or maybe, I think I did Parallax Mode. That's what I did. I did a mode where any hero can become possessed by Parallax and turn into a villain. I think that, that was what I did. But I never, ever expected or dreamed that giant yellow bug monster would actually be a miniature and you can fight him as a villain. This is my favorite. This might be my favorite thing that they put in this box. So Parallax is the embodiment of fear and will do everything in its power to break the hero's will. Each time it manages to make a hero cower or run away in fear, it accelerates the next villain turn. This might happen when Parallax raises its location, scattering the heroes, when heroes are KO'd, or when an overflow eliminates all civilians caught in the mass panic. If a hero is brave enough to attack Parallax, they'll need to spend a heroic action just to keep themselves from running away after dealing a single damage. Also, Parallax's influence keeps lantern heroes from using their power rings near it. Ooh, ooh. yeah, he's going to short out those rings. Parallax senses fear and will usually move directly to the locations where heroes are huddled in together, pouncing on them and sending them fleeing in all directions. The threats in each location challenge heroes to overcome their fears. Initially, clearing a threat takes an enormous amount of heroic actions, but with each one that is cleared, it becomes easier as heroes break from the grip of fear. That's cool. And then when a hero has overcome their fears, they no longer flee from Parallax, finding the willpower to stand their ground and bring down the yellow entity. So it says to clear this threat, heroes must place here as many stars as the total number of threats on location. So the first one takes six stars, the next one takes five. Wow. 
that's so cool. And what a great in-game way to represent overcoming your fear. Something that starts off almost impossible but gets easier and easier every time you do it. This this is so special. Look at that. And that's him compared to Robin. So he's actually not even that huge, right? Because we've seen like Trigon is bigger. Thoreau is bigger. He's only like two times the size of a normal mini. But based on this photo, he looks gigantic. He looks like a gargantuan piece of plastic. And I love that they integrated that the power rings can't work with him. I was thinking the other day how if people wanted, they could do a house rule where if you play as a Green Lantern character, if the villain you're playing against wears yellow in their costume, you could do a house rule where they can't have their rings as equipment uh, just to, to go with that old crazy weakness against yellow. If you want to be a purist about it like that, uh, there you go. There's a free house rule on me. Wow. I I can't believe Parallax is in this game. And then that was it. That was the final stretch goal, and it didn't quite get reached, but Simon has been generous in the past with that, and same here now. They just went ahead and unlocked it anyway, and we got this beautiful message with Condiment King squirting ketchup and mayo and mustard all over the screen to thank us for just an outstanding campaign. There's no sort of secret code here. What's next in the master plan? Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. It's been an immense pleasure and honor to be able to partner with Spin Master and DC once again to bring this amazing roster of characters into the United System. Special thanks to Mike Bisogno, who has been a longtime rock in the United line, lending his support and expertise at every stage of the process. We'd also like to thank everyone involved into making DC Superheroes United happen. The game design team, the artists, the sculptors of Big Child Creatives, the graphic design team, the production team, the marketing team, and the video makers. Hey, I'm one of those. You are the ones that make dreams like this come true. Now another part of the work begins. We're very excited to take this to the final stage and deliver it to all of you. Yeah, in all seriousness, thank you. That was a very, very fun campaign. Um, it's It's been a hot minute since Multiverse, so it's great to jump back into that United campaign feeling. I have a lot of fond memories of the Multiverse one, you know, being at work and, and, and checking the feed. Uh, I was working at summer camp this during this campaign and of all things it's not even a dc united thing it was um it was the marvel united update about the witching hour uh we're sitting at summer camp uh and um the the kids were just sort of sitting around eating their lunch and i was on my phone and i i got that email that said the witching hour is going to be a thing and i literally went ah and the kids around me turned and were like you okay what should, should we call the doctor uh so i i just got so excited by uh, by seeing that, and I really hope we can get our hands on the Witching Hour here in Canada soon. But then the DC Superheroes United of it all, too, was just constantly uh, the brightest spot of all of July. And thankfully, some good news. I did manage to pledge and get myself a copy. I did. Uh, I, I I can't get everything. I, I just It's not in the cards. I cannot get everything, but... I got a lot of great stuff that I have I think is going to be so exciting and so fun to play with. I cannot wait for that box to come to my doorstep in, oh God, what, February 2026 or something? Who knows? Uh, I'm still waiting for Multiverse too. So I'm just, I'm really, really super happy, super grateful that I'm fortunate enough to be able to uh, to get the uh, the game and uh, just super happy to have been able to talk about it with all of you, with all the, the fans in this really, really fun, positive community. And I look forward to more. I look forward to more United. And I'll tell you what, you know, you, the, there's a lot of talk out there about, you know, what could they do next, whatever. And I've heard a lot of people talk about Transformers United because I think they own the Transformers rights. I think Simon and Spin Master have the rights to Transformers. I could be wrong. And other other folks like uh, like the Meeple Monkey have suggested they could very well do like a My Hero Academia United, right? There, There's a lot of avenues they could take. And I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this. I'm not a Transformers fan or a My Hero Academia fan. But if one of those things should happen to be announced as the next United game, I will do my best to continue to cover those campaigns and whatever other announcements they make for those just because the united system itself is so much fun i just have fun watching it be unveiled and talking about it with all of you so even though i definitely am not as big a transformers fan and it's not something i would go in on i am down 
to just sit and have fun and bask in the joy that is a United campaign if such a thing was ever to happen. But hopefully, my heart, my soul, really hopes that a Marvel Season 4 isn't far away. Um, but let's get multiverse first. Please, pretty please. I'm waiting. I'm waiting, shipping label, wherever you are. That'll do it for me today here on Digital Charcuterie. Thank you so much for tuning in. I will see you all here next time as we continue to make the wait for Marvel United Multiverse a little bit shorter and a whole lot sweeter. See you next time.